Hello there, this is a ray casting video based on OpenGL. We're going to be sending a ray from the camera into the screen and this is going to be happening in 3D space. We then use the ray as it projects into 3D space to intersect into any objects that we want and we can use it to, we call it mouse picking. So you've got ray casting or mouse picking, kind of the same thing, just two different names. Not ray tracing, that's something a little bit more advanced, but ray casting is still the proper name for mouse picking. And so the ray goes into 3D space, will intersect into a sphere, light up the pixels where the ray goes through the sphere, and we can also make the pixels transparent. I'll show you every step that we need to follow to get this up and running, and we've got the full source code, it's a full working example you can get the source code from my website, but don't go and do that yet. Make sure you watch this video because obviously you need to understand what's going on at each stage in case you run into problems, otherwise it's just not going to make any sense. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is just understand something about the overall process. So let's look at this little animation that I've made. We've got the Spider-Man spinning round. You can see that this is on a 2D plane. And so there's no 3D to this image. So this is basically what you're going to see on the monitor. And it is a rendering of this 3D Spider-Man that you can see just here. If I rotate it round, you can see that we've got the 3D Spider-Man. And if we look straight on, if I just get the angle exactly correct, we can see now that you can almost not see any difference. There we go. So if I move him back, you'll see that that is therefore a rendered 2D image of that 3D Spider-Man. So we're going to, and that's called screen space. So the Spider-Man that you can see flipping around on the 2D plane, that's basically screen space. It's just what you're looking at on your monitor. Um, if we now continue with this animation, you'll see that we're going to NDC space. When you're going through the graphics pipeline, normalize device coordinates when you get to that stage gets mapped to the screen. And so this is now going in reverse. So we're starting off with the screen. We move the mouse pointer somewhere over the screen and we need to convert the screen coordinates back to normalized device coordinates. But before we get stuck into that, we are going to need a sphere that we draw in Blender. So I'll show you how to draw a sphere in Blender from scratch, exactly what we need to do. We need to delete the default cube. The cursor is still at the screen center, the scene center, zero, zero, zero. I'm just gonna open up this so we can see where the cursor is, there we are. And we need to add a sphere, you can select a U V sphere or an icosphere doesn't matter I think I'm going to go to six or seven divisions we'll go to six subdivisions now let's go for seven and the radius so we want the radius to be two because as you'll see in a moment within the program in the code I have based the calculations on the radius of the sphere being two so we'll change that just there and now we need to add an image. I'm using a equirectangular image of Earth, which is correct for a sphere, which means that we need to unwrap the sphere. We do that by going into the UV editor. Let's just close this. We need to open a new window, go into the UV editor, and go into edit mode we can see that that's incorrect. That's not a spherical UV map. With all of them selected, select unwrap, sphere projection, and there we have. That's the correct mapping for a sphere. We now need to add an image for that. So let's go and, first of all, we need to download the image. I'm gonna show you where you can get that from. If we go to Wikimedia Commons, just drag this up over here. So Wikimedia Commons, if we just type in Equirectangular, 
Earth. There's a few that come up and you can pick any of these. I can't find the one that I've got. It was from a long while ago, probably over a year ago, and it looks almost identical to one of these. So you can pick any one that you want. Um, let's go for this one. We can see that it's in the public domain. And if we go into more details and view that, we can just download it and download the original file, which I'll do. You can see that I've already done that. And then we just need to save that in the images folder. And so now we need to add a new material. Let's select image texture and find the file release images there I've got the two in there so I'll pick the one that you'll have just downloaded if you selected the same one and let's go out of edit mode you still can't see it because we need to go from viewport shading solid to color and there we go so we've got the perfect image of our earth now I'm going to be showing you a transparency trick. So once the mouse pointer goes and the ray collides and intersects through the earth, we can make the pixels, the fragments, light up a different color. And we can therefore not just change the color, we can make it transparent. For that to work, we need to order the mesh faces from front to back. Otherwise it just looks random and it looks a complete mess. It's really easy to do that in Blender. All we do is select all the, let's just close this window now. Select all the vertices. I'm gonna open that window back up. And this is why I wanted to show you where the cursor position was. At the moment, it's at naught, naught, naught. We need to slide it back any amount so that it's just outside the sphere. So minus 2.3. And now select all the vertices go to the mesh menu and come down to sort elements select cursor distance select faces and reverse now that's actually done this is weird about blender that's actually done what you need to happen i always feel like there should be a go option on there so just right click anywhere in the scene and that's gone but it was done anyway all we need to do now is export it. We go to export wavefront object and I'm going to, and I'm placing the object file in the release folder. This is the code that you'll find from model loading part one of my OpenGL quick start series. I have added this little mouse callback at the top just because we are going to be using the mouse wheel. Otherwise, there's nothing different from what you've already seen up until we get to pretty much here, where I've titled it sphere variables. So the first thing we've got is a few transformation matrices. We'll look at what those do as we go along. So just these three transformation matrices that we need to add. And we are going to translate the sphere in Blender, we created it at position 0, 0, 0, because we didn't change the cursor position, which is where we want it at the center of the scene. And so from that position, we get to control in our program exactly where it's going to end up. So just here, you'll see in the notes that I've put change sphere position from Blender 0, 0, 0. So I'm setting it back seven deeper into the screen. There's the radius variable that you need to remember to set to whichever size you create the sphere at in Blender. So you can create the sphere any size you want, but this has to match. Otherwise, it isn't going to work because the calculations need to match the geometry of the model that you create in the modeling software. Obviously, I'm using Blender. You could be using something else. I have created it with a radius of two like I just showed you. And therefore, we set this value to that same value. And now this is um, not much code here either. I mean, we only need to do just these few lines of code and that's the ray done we've created the ray we've also got the option to use glm on project but i just thought if we do it ourselves manually it's going to make a lot more sense 
GLM does all that for us, if we don't have any clue really how that's working, it's just going to help us a lot if we do. So I thought it's better if we just do that ourselves. And then we can compare the results with GLM just to prove that we've got the right answer because we know GLM is correct. And if we can get the same values, then we know that we've done it correct. So I just thought, let's do it ourselves. First of all, then we've got these two lines of code, which get us from screen space, which I'm just going to drag that window back over. As we go from screen space, again, you can see Spider-Man flipping around that screen space now. We go to NDC space with these two lines of code. We've got the mouse position, X and Y positions that we get off GLFW. We divide two by the window width and window height because that gives us the fractional value of NDC space. We know that the NDC cube is minus one to plus one in all three axes. And so that's a total size of two. If we divide that two, by the number of pixels, the window width, number of pixels and height, it gives us the fractional value of NDC space. Therefore, when we times that result by the mouse position, again, in screen pixels, it gives us the correct percentage answer. So that's how we get from screen space to NDC space, which is pretty straightforward. But this is where it gets trickier because what we need to do now is go from NDC space back to 3D space. It looks similar. So for example, when I work this animation now, you can see that we start off at screen space, we go to NDC space, and then we go back to 3D space. And so the frustum is representative. It exists within 3D space, screen space, NDC cube back to 3D space. And so what the hell are these lines of code doing? You might be wondering. I'm gonna explain that to you now. So we need to work out the height of the near plane and the half field of view. So the field of view, the full field of view is both sides of center. And we're gonna be working with a right angle triangle. So we're gonna be looking at the calculation just from one side of center. So it's half the field of view. So FOV divided by two. So by multiplying the tangent of the half field of view by the near plane distance, which is the distance from the camera to the near plane, it gives us the near plane height. And that's the first variable that we need. So how do we get the Y value from NDC space scaled back to becoming the viewport window of the view frustum. We do that simply by multiplying the percentage by the near plane height, and that's it. It's then just proportionally in the correct position. And that's all you need to do. But because we're not working with a square window, because I've got a widescreen window, we'd also need to apply the aspect ratio. So it's the same calculation for the X value. So we're still gonna times that by the near plane height, that would work if it was square, but because we're going wider, we multiply it by the aspect ratio and that gives, us the, that gives us the correct X value at that point as well. And we've got the point because we've now just added in the near plane value. So that's brilliant. One more thing we need to understand though, and this is, it's not too bad to understand, but I find this a little bit tricky, but it's important because we need to, have some idea of what's going on with the view matrix rather than just sort of assume that it takes care of things for us because it really does change how you're thinking about 3d space again so we've got the camera position which we know is correct has to be correct because we pass that into glm so at the top like we do for any of our programs we tell glm just here with glm look at we pass it in the camera position so we know that the camera position is at the correct space, the correct position in 3D space for the calculation. But do we think we've now got the correct point in 3D space for the near plane? Because we're gonna be going from the camera position to the point on the near plane to get our ray, that's the ray that we're casting, call it a direction vector. 
we think we've got the correct point on the near plane, but we haven't. We have to multi, we have to invert the view matrix. The way that this works is that the camera doesn't really exist. And I'll put a snippet on screen now from the last tutorial. When you specify the camera position, the camera doesn't exist. It just means that it tells, it's a way of giving, you give that value to GLM and then GLM works out a view matrix, which moves all of the pixels in the scene, only because we apply that view matrix to all of the models in the vertex shader. But the view matrix is a matrix that when you multiply any model by it, it moves the positions in 3D space so that they correspond to looking at the view thrust which is basically always at the same position in 3D space. It's just at the center of 3D space. It's never anywhere else. Everything else gets brought into vision. And so once we undo the view matrix and put the point back in space, we've then got both correct points to be able to project a ray or just imagine a line from the camera position to that point that's now correctly in 3D space. And we've got the ray that runs through 3D space, which is what we want. And then all we need to do is just subtract the values. So we can start off with the near plane and subtract the camera position. And we've got the camera direction vector. That is our ray. Let's now compile the program. I'm just gonna comment. No, I'll leave all of that code open because it won't matter. Let's now, so let's now run the program. Let's uncomment these lines and we'll look inside. And compile. That's because I've already got the program open. Let's close it. Let's do that again. There we go. So let's run the program and look in the console window to see the values of GLM. I'll just quickly show you. So we've got our own camera direction value that we've just worked out ourselves, X, Y, and Z. And we've got unproject next to each one. So for every one that we've done, we look at GLMs as well to make sure that we've done it correct. There's ours and there's GLMs, that one there. So let's compile, well, have a, yeah, I've compiled it already. So let's run this and see where we are. Yes, this is all working, but you won't be there yet unless you've just copy and pasted the code in. So let's bring this over. So we can see now, anywhere that I move this, mouse pointer and it settles down the values are identical 0.159916 so we can see we've got the same for the x we've got the same for the y and we've got the same for the z you choose a different position and let it settle and we can see again that we've got exactly the same values there's a rounding difference there but otherwise it's exactly the same difference the next thing we need to do for you to get to where i've just shown you with the earth on the screen is just understand the ray intersection aspect. Now, this is also a little bit tricky. And I'm going to try and make it as straightforward as I can. Let's shrink it down and go through the lines of code one at a time. In fact, first of all, I'm just going to show you. So what's going on there, you might wonder. I did try drawing a sphere and you can't see anything because even if you do a really low mesh sphere, it still gets in the way. So just imagine if you take two circles and you move them so that they're at the same center as each other and you pivot one of them round, then you're moving around within the sphere. It's the same thing. You don't need to draw a sphere. So that's what I've done there. I've just got two circles and as we move it around, we can see what's happening with the triangles that you can see on screen that you're probably thinking, what are those triangles for? I'm just about to show you what they are for. Let's open up Photoshop. Ah, it's already open. There we go. These triangles, as you can see, 
they're three right angled triangles. All we need to work out the intersect point are three right angled triangles. This is the ray that runs from the camera. The camera's just here. This is the intersect point. If we can calculate this length, then when we travel along that length, which is the ray that we're casting from the camera position, we arrive at the point in 3D space where the ray passes through the sphere. So that's all we need to do. And to do that, we just need to deal with three right angle triangles. The reason that I've done the animation in Blender is because when we look at that image, it kind of makes me feel like I'm just looking at a 2D image situation. I don't want to have that kind of locked in my mind thinking I'm doing a 2D calculation. So I thought if we draw it in Blender, the triangle, the three triangles, now we can see why it's a 3D scenario. Parts of the calculation are just lengths. And so in, in a way that's kind of 2D. But when we look at the, I'll just show you actually, when we've got the these values, the camera to sphere center is a VEC3 and the sphere position is a VEC3 and the ray intersect point is a VEC3. So all the VEC3s are representative of 3D space. The two key ones are the sphere position and the camera to sphere center and the camera position, which is also a VEC3, as we can see there. That means that when we take the position from the camera center to the sphere, so it's that line just there that you can see. Let's just zoom in a little bit. It's a three dimensional scenario, obviously, because we're in 3D space, the same as the ray that we're casting is. What was the other disc? The, the camera position is there. So that's a 3D calculation. It looks like it's just a 2D situation when we just look at the diagram, but the diagram is valid for the whole of the 3D scenario. So we don't need to worry about this animation. It just, I thought it just makes it clearer that we can see the triangles, the three triangles that we're working with. I thought it just makes it clearer so that we can see how that corresponds to the reality of the situation. And it's that. One other thing I just wanted to point out is this. If we get to, where are we with the camera? If well, I need to zoom back out. When we go and rotate the camera, let's just zoom in a bit. If we rotate the camera on the spot without changing the camera position, it's the same thing as if we were to move the ray or move our mouse over the screen. So you watch this. If I do that, we can see that ray represents where your mouse is on the screen, don't forget. So just by rotating the camera, that would be equivalent to if you move your mouse pointer. But when watch what happens when we move the mouse position and do a couple of things in combination. So let's rotate the camera and also move its position. The triangles all change. So, <clears throat> but notice that they're still right angle triangles. So that geometry that we've just looked at, that we're looking at now, is true to the whole situation, again, regardless of the camera position and orientation and everything. So basically that 2D representation of the three triangles, three right angle triangles, is completely valid for the whole of the situation in 3D space for the ray casting, wherever the camera is, whatever the camera is pointing at, whatever the camera target is that we give to GLM as well, wherever the sphere is, whatever the sphere size is, whatever the projection um, field of view is set to, all of that makes no difference. The only thing we need to do is just deal with these three triangles and then we've got the intersect point. So it's kind of surprisingly simple once you realize all that but at the same time getting to the point to realize that it's fairly simple is fairly complicated now anyway so let's have a look at sphere position look we need to go through these lines of code a little bit at a time let's just close the solution explorer 
there we go got a bit more room and just shrink that down slightly right sphere position that's easy because it's simply the glm vec 4 which is we need to put that always on top that's better right so we've got sphere position in blender it's at 0 0 0 and we transform the position of the sphere by the transformation matrix which we're not doing that yet and i'm going to leave that in i'll just quickly show you in the vertex shader i've got two copies of the vertex shader open the minimal vertex shader that you're probably likely to see in any example that you're ever going to go through it's not even got i mean it's just five lines of code this is actually the full version which we'll get to in a moment where we use the transformation matrix i've commented it for this stage that we're at and therefore that's not going to do anything because um it's not being used in the vertex shader the sphere position therefore is just what we set it at at the top which is this spec three and we want camera to sphere center that's easy just the sphere position take away the camera position so that's not complicated <clears throat> we need to work out the angular difference between this line which is the camera to sphere center as you can see now highlighted in blender in orange and let's just select the ray and that so ray direction and camera to sphere center this is the angular difference between those two lines and once we've done that we've got radians and degrees i sometimes put things in degrees just because i feel more comfortable working with those units rather than radians it might even be that you'll see certain values in degrees that i've ended up not using but just ignore that if you do we need to work with radians when we're asking for glm to give us the angle between two different vectors through 3d space so now that we've got the angle between the ray and the camera to sphere center that means that we can work out the length of this side so just taking the sine which is opposite over hypotenuse we've got the sine of the angle angular difference multiplied by the camera to sphere length and that gives us the length of that side so that's the first step so once we've got the length of that side that's the main outside triangle the big the overall thing so that side them two sides if they were joined together in this side so that's the length of the opposite side for the overall triangle and we now have small triangle one small triangle one and we're nearly there so it's not much to do so now that we've got the opposite side we can work out if we take that opposite side and divide it by the sphere radius so that divided by that that's the hypotenuse and therefore the opposite over the hypotenuse we know that we get from sine gives us this angle now we know that any line that spans away from any other line the angle either side of that line has to total 180 degrees so the angle that we've just worked out plus that angle must be 180 degrees therefore we can easily calculate this angle because it's just 180 degrees take away what we've just worked out which is where this comes from angle 180 degrees difference so now we've got two angles which correspond to this triangle formed from these three legs the one that we've just worked out and the initial angle which is the difference between the ray direction and the camera to sphere center which is this angle and we've got the same kind of situation again we know that there's 180 degrees in that triangle those three legs therefore if we subtract from 180 the value that we just worked out the initial angular difference we then get that angle and from that angle we can work out the length of this side 
when we've got sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, and so therefore that transposes to opposite equals sine times by the hypotenuse. So we multiply that angle by the length of the hypotenuse and we get this length. So a little bit of a kind of roller coaster getting to that point, but it's really only just a few calculations. And now we've got the length of that side and this is the final step. You can probably see where we're gonna go with this already. We divide it by the sine of the main angular difference. And we're only after the length, don't forget, because we know the direction, but we need to know the length. And so there we've got the ray intersect length. The ray intersect length is some value. The length remains the same, but we're giving it a direction by multiplying it by the unit ray direction. We're not quite there yet because we need to, whereabouts does it start? The camera position. So we just add the camera position to, like I said, it's the ray direction multiplied by the length that we just worked out. We add that onto the camera position and then we've got our ray intersect point. Once we've got the intersect point, we need to send it to the vertex shader, which we do by this line. I'll just get rid of that now. So this line, we send it to the vertex shader. And as you've just saw, seen in the vertex shader, it's pretty simple. The ray intersect point, there it is. And this is pretty simple. We've got the vertex position transform. We're not doing any transforms to the sphere at the moment. It's just staying where it is. And so therefore that's just set directly to the APOS value just there. So we just look at the vertex position that's being processed for the current invocation. And that is this value, APOS. And if we subtract that or subtract the ray intersect point from it, we just get a distance for every given vertex during the whole of the render call. Therefore, when it's rendering the vertices that are further away from the intersect point. So let's just imagine close to the outskirts of the sphere, that value is going to be bigger. And I'm asking for an absolute value because we could have negative or positive and we always want, we're only interested in the value of pure distance. It doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive. So we need to make sure that it's always going to be positive. So we've got apps for absolute and that goes out float into the vertex shader uh, into the fragment shader and in the fragment shader the only thing that we do with it all of this is nothing more than the model loading part one open gel just the basic basic lighting code which i'm going to do another tutorial on to explain that properly and so the only thing that goes on is these two lines of code, just an if statement. So really one line of code. So just to avoid a potential divide by zero error, we've got this if statement check. But other than that, it's just this one line. If we've got the vertex that's right up close to where the mouse pointer is, we know that that distance is gonna be a really small value. Therefore, if we divide 0.1 any value, but I've just found out that this is a good a good scale to start off with. So if we divide any value, but we've got 0.1 divided by that point, that, that distance, which is almost nothing because it's right up close to where the pointer is, it's gonna be a big result because obviously when you divide any number by a smaller number, you get a bigger result. And therefore it's gonna be greener, closer to where the mouse pointer is. If the distance is really big, so for the vertices that are furthest away, nearer to the outskirts of the sphere, for example, then you've got 0.1 divided by a really big value. And so it's gonna be a really little result. And so you're not gonna get hardly any green. And so just that one single line is how we make a, a concentration of change, just local to where the mouse pointer is intersecting into the sphere. So let's go back into the main program. And so we need to now enable this option one 
is the best option. So let's just undo this. Well, I say option one is the best option. It's the mouse control. It's the one I prefer. I want Earth to be controlled by the mouse position, but I want Earth to stay at the same position along the z-axis. So I only want to control the x and y position. And to do that, we need to work out where our projection, where our ray that we've cast, that we've now just worked out how to calculate the intersect point. But I want to know where the point is in 3D space that the ray crosses over the same, becomes the same z distance as the sphere itself. To do that, we first subtract the near plane point z value from the sphere position matrix z value. That gives us the z distance, but it doesn't give us anything other than that at that stage. So that's near z to sphere z. If, however, we divide that z value by the z component of the ray direction, that then gives us the multiple of our unit ray vector, direction vector, that we would need to travel that many of our direction vector to end up at the same z-axis value that the sphere's at. So we multiply that value by the ray direction and add that to the point on the near plane, which represents where our mouse pointer is, and that will take us to the ray point at sphere z, which is this variable. Once we've done that, the only thing left to do is work out the difference between the x and y values. Well, that's really easy because if we look ray point at sphere z, so that's an actual location in 3D space, we can just simply read off the x value, read off the y value, same thing for the sphere position again that is the fourth column at position three x is naught and y is the next one so that's position one both in the fourth column obviously and if we therefore subtract those two values the x from the x and the y from the y we get the difference in x and y position at that given depth value and then all we do is translate the sphere position matrix by those differences, difference X and difference Y. You'll notice that I'm multiplying the two values by 0 0.03. That's just to stop it going there instantly. I think it just looks more, just looks a bit better. You can kind of see what's going on more rather than just have the earth instantly stick into wherever the mouse pointer is. Seeing it go there just with a little bit of a delay just looks more interesting, I thought. So that's why I've done that. Completely optional. You don't need to do that. And the mouse wheel, as I showed you at the beginning, we're getting that from the GLFW callback. Um, I'm just multiplying that by 0 0.5 just to slow it down slightly. Don't need to do that either. And so it's just those three values. We now need to compile it and run it, but not until we've enabled the code that I just showed you in the vertex shader, um, we do pass that transformation matrix over on this line. That's the one I showed you that was commented. So we need to uncomment it like so. And I will comment this and uncomment this. And I'll just quickly show you the difference. Not really a lot. We've now got the transformation matrix. So therefore, rather than just sending the point through to the fragment shader directly from APOS, we multiply it by the transformation. That's the model transformation matrix. Fear transmat is the model transformation matrix. No different to anything you've done in the previous tutorials. Same thing with the normal vector, rather than just sending it straight across, we transform it by the model matrix again. And we just insert the transformation matrix just there in between the view matrix and the vertex position APOS. 
so we've just inserted it just there if we now save this and let's compile and let's run that and see where we are There we go and I can zoom in so this is awesome so I can move earth around anywhere in the screen look at the perspective distortion as we go to the corner and if I just quickly it also allows me to do that so by having it delayed allows me to kind of um, move the mouse relative to where earth is rather than it just be stuck to the center of earth all the while so you can see it working at the edges in fact if I slow that down even more Let's just change that to one and do the same again. Compile that and run it. There, that's much slower. So there we go. We've got a fully three dimensional example of ray projection. And I think this is really good. We can go into there, we've gone past the near plane now, so it isn't working. Um, there was one last thing I wanted to show you. First of all, I'll just quickly show you those random orbits. Um, you don't really need to do this. It's not that much fun, but I just thought I'll do it. So we just need to uncomment that section. That's option two that we're now going to be doing. Um, comment this. Uncomment our random code just there and let's compile and run that and see what we get there that's better so we just need to move the camera way out so we can see now that we've got earth and if I just leave the mouse pointer as it goes over you'll see it flash there you go let it collide over there you go so we've got um, we can't control it with the mouse anymore because obviously this is just a different way of manipulating the position of Earth. But the point is, um, it absolutely works in every scenario. So this is really, really, I think it's mega cool, to be honest. I love it. So that was just adding the green on the Earth. The only thing I haven't shown you yet is how we set the transparency up. Just go into the fragment shade up and we need to comment this line. That's the one that adds the green, just there. And uncomment this line you can see that the only difference is that we've got dot g and dot a a is for alpha and so we're just changing the alpha value in exactly the same way as we did before for the green value and that's it so we just need to click save so let's run this and see what we get and there we go that's what if you recall you will have seen at the beginning of the video we can zoom right in there and let's just change the value from 0.5 to 1.5 and see what difference that makes see we've got a much bigger transparency circle so that's cool one thing I just wanted to show you before we finish and that is you only allow something to happen like you've only got the ability to drag earth around the screen when you click the mouse button but you have to be the mouse pointer has to already be over earth so in other words you're doing a collision detection with the mouse and then you're locking on with the button and then dragging if you want to do that you need to know if you are intersecting or not it's one thing working out the intersect point um but that kind of when you think about it that's not a yes or no am i intersecting you've just assumed that the geometry is going to work out well, we know that if we go past the limits of right angle triangles, something's going to go wrong. And this is why it's well worth, well worth just having a quick look at what I'm going to show you now. So if we look at the ray intersect point, now we've got both things on the screen. Watch this. So we can see that the points that we're calculating through that intersect calculation are given as valid values. But look at what happens as soon as I go away off the sphere they're all not a number that's because we've basically crashed the three triangles those the geometry of those three triangles is valid those three right angle triangles it's valid for the situation 
that we saw when we when we drew the three triangles and we see it moving within the spherical scenario when it's rotating around the 3D space. If if you were to project a line outside of that spherical distance, the right angle triangles become invalidated. You can take advantage of the fact that we're getting not a number once the mouse pointer is outside of the sphere for collision detection. So for example, you can just simply ask the question if any of the three values, the X, Y, or Z value of the ray intersect point are valid numbers, you know that it's a collision. The ray is intersecting through the sphere. So you've got a method there for collision detection. So that's everything for this tutorial. If you need the source code, then go over to my website, programmingcreatively.com, and you can just copy and paste it from there. Especially if you've got this far, if you've not managed to get it working, just ask me in the comments and I'll do everything I can to answer any questions that you've got to get you up and running with this. I really will. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a like. It really does help. So see you next time. Cheers.